our God, our Father, who is holy, he is worthy, he is worthy of all the honor and glory and praise. So let's stand and worship and use your song sheets if you don't know any of the words. pages uh this next song just is about god being our good good father and kevin so beautifully illustrated that for us this morning and what that looks like and uh, i just think of him being a father and loving us and what that means as far as like even showing discipline and correction and he does that in love and just to draw us closer to him so let's let's sing and continue to worship Oh, 
God, we're so thankful for your goodness and your love towards us that even while we were sinners, you still died for us on the cross so that we could have eternity with you. God, we just, we bring you all the praise and honor and glory for you're worthy and you're holy. God, I just pray over these offerings that, uh, that they would continue to bless your name. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen.
This morning, our prayer focus is our music ministry here at Glen Hope. The Apostle Paul, speaking of how Christians ought to live in Ephesians chapter 5, says, in verse 19, says, Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your hearts to the Lord. And so we're told to speak to each other in various types of songs, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. And in a lot of different ways, the music ministry here um, helps us to facilitate that expression of what Paul calls us towards in Ephesians 5. Um, This is a vital ministry of our church. There's lots of different moving parts in this ministry. You've got singers, you've got musicians, you've got AV and sound people, you've got people who have to go and get words together because the... AV decided it didn't want to work in the, right before service started. Um, you've got different team makeups. You've got special selections. And then you've got song selection in general to make sure everything we say is correct and has good theology. Because there's a lot of Christian music that ain't so Christian these days. And so this is a vital ministry. And it would be very easy for us to, as we pray for the various ministries on a lot of Sunday mornings, to look past this ministry. And we certainly don't want to do that. So let's join together and pray for them. Father, we thank you for the expression of of praise and worship and teaching and learning that you give us through music, through singing, that you show us that from your word. There's collections of hymns and songs, and that you call us to speak to one another in this way. We thank you for the music ministry here at Glen Hope that helps us to do this on a week-in and week-out basis. We thank you that they feed us good theology through the words we sing. We ask that you would be with them as they continue to do this, that you would strengthen them, and that as they lead us in worship on so many days through singing, that everything we say and do would bring glory and honor to your name and would be pleasing in your sight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Right. Thank you guys for your participation in, in worship this morning. It's been a good time. Uh, we pray and hope that our Father has been pleased with what we have offered him this morning. Now, I did not anticipate that my daughter Savannah would be here this morning, but it actually is very fortuitous. She came in from Winston-Salem for the weekend. Um, helps with this story I'm about to tell you. Now, everyone who knows our family, even if you don't know us, or perhaps you've seen us, everyone knows that Savannah and Kim look a lot alike. A lot. Right? I mean, sometimes I even get confused. If, I'm like a, if they're across a parking lot and I'm looking over there, and I'm like, wait a minute, which is which? You know, I mean, it, they look a lot alike. So I must tell you that I was very, very satisfied one day about 10, 12 years ago. Savannah and I were in line to get a sandwich at a Subway restaurant. And the sandwich artist at Subway, when we got to the counter, looked at us and said, I know that that is your daughter because she looks just like you from the side. This is the first time ever that anyone had ever said anything like that. And so I was greatly pleased. And this was an artist, right? This is a sandwich. This is, the artists have an eye for stuff like that. And so this artist said, she looks just like you from the side, man. And as you can tell, 12 years later, I'm still holding on to that, right? But it, 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 was, it was a good day. It was a good day. Today is going to be a good day. As we all discover that we have a spiritual father that we look like. 
for many of us, it's going to be a, a reiteration of what you already know. For some, it may be an eye-opener that you got to consider that there's more than one option of a spiritual father that you look like. We're going to discover that there's more than one option here. There are two options of, of which father you may resemble. And so today's question is, who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? John chapter 8, verses 37 through 47. The scripture says, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are seeking to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak of the things which I've seen with my father. Therefore, you also do the things which you heard from your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you are seeking to kill me a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. This Abraham did not do. You are doing the deeds of your father. They said to him, we were not born as a result of sexual immorality. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came forth from God and am here. For I have not even come on my own, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I am saying? It is because you cannot listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature because he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I say the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak truth, why do you not believe me? The one who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason, you do not hear them, because you are not of God. Let's pray. Father, we praise you that we can call you Father. Praise you, God, that in your good plan you have, you have adopted many of us that are in this room today. You've, you've made us your, we, we're here because we understand that you are a father and we want to worship you, honor you, and praise you in this place today. God, thank you for putting us in this position. Thank you, God, that we see and understand something of your goodness as we see it in our lives, around our lives, and in the lives of our brothers and sisters, God. We see your goodness there. We see your goodness and even in your common grace extended to even the people who are rejecting you in this world, God, we know that you are good and that you are a good father and we understand, God, and I pray that we even have a growing understanding through our time today, God, that we understand something of your goodness only because your goodness has opened our eyes to that truth. God, I pray that in our time today, our, our, our appreciation and understanding of of who you are as a father will, will grow and that it will overflow in the way that we live our lives, in the way that we worship you, in the way that we serve you, in the way that we interact with people around us. I pray, God, that if there are folks here who do not know you or folks who will see this later on who do not know you as father, that this will be a time, God, this will be the time when you open their eyes, when you move them from spiritual blindness and darkness into the marvelous light and marvelous truth of, of knowing you as Father. God, we call upon your, your mercy. We call upon your grace. 
to move people to understanding you as their father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So guys, in, in this scripture that we're studying today, kind of a, a foundational moment or two before we get into some specifics. One, we've got to understand that when it comes to who your daddy is, you're going you're gonna to look like God or the devil. There's, there's two choices. There's two realities about who your spiritual father is. Everyone who has ever walked on the face of the earth and whoever will walk on the face of the earth faces this reality that I either look like my father God or I look like my father the devil. That's the, that's the reality for every single one of us. And the truth is that every single one of us except for Adam and Eve, start out with their father being the devil. Adam and Eve started out with a perfect relationship with God. But then, not long after, <laughs> they kind of became adopted by the devil. And Romans chapter 5, verse 12, teaches us that through that sin that entered the world through Adam and Eve and through the devil becoming their spiritual father in, in that moment, and that, that was passed on to all of us. And so every single human being is born with the reality that the devil is their, that Satan, the devil, is our spiritual father. Every single one of us is born that way. The, the Puritans understood this in, in seeing a, a brand new baby, not as a bundle of joy, but as a bundle of sin. And they went about their lives seeking to, to straighten that out. They were a little extreme in some cases and some of the way they went about it. But they, on some level, their theological understanding w was true. That that, that that baby was, yes, sinful. It could still be a bundle of joy. I think you'll agree, right? It's still a bundle of joy, but by nature, sinful. By nature, sinful. Every one of us starts that way. And it's only because of the grace of God that his plan allows then for us to be adopted. Some of us then will be adopted. We get a, we get a new father. We get a new spiritual father when God himself adopts us and makes us his. That's kind of some of what we will explore today. And so that's part of the generality that, that we ha have to understand, the foundational element that we understand. God, devil, two options for spiritual fathers. We all start here with the devil as a spiritual father and only being adopted by God does he become our spiritual father. Now, we can also understand that generally speaking, you're going to talk like your father, talk like your parents. And you know, sometimes that makes for Nervous moments for parents when you, when you send your kid off to Sunday school or children's church. Uh, some churches where they have children come up front and, you know, and they, you get this interaction going and you're, some parents are just holding their breath, right? Because their kid might, like, might talk like them. They might, they might say some things that you don't want everyone at church knowing that you say at home. And certainly we encounter that in our interactions with children on Sunday mornings. We encounter that a lot on Wednesdays with some of the kids we, we interact with. But, but children are going to talk like their father, talk like their parents. And so today we're going to be thinking about that, applying that more specifically as we go through. But it works either way. You know, if you're a child of God, if God is your father, part of the goal is to sound like him. But if the devil is your father, you're going to sound like him. So whoever your, your father is, you're going, to, you're going to sound like him. Jesus alludes to this, and, you know, that that's the truth, and, and that, that it reveals something about us. The, 
the things that come out of our mouths. Over in Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse 34, he says, you offspring of vipers, how can you, being evil, express any good things? All right, so if you're evil, of your, of your father the devil, you're not going to express good things. It's just impossible. He says, for the mouth speaks from that which fills the heart. The mouth speaks from that which fills the heart. The good person brings out of his good treasure good things, and the evil person brings out of his evil treasure evil things. But I tell you that for every careless word that people speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So do your words sound like your father God or your father the devil? You're going to sound like your daddy. Also, generally speaking, we understand that we're going to carry out the deeds of your father. You're going to sound like him. You're going to look like him. You're going to look like him in the things that you do. You're going to, you're going to act like him. You're going to you know, physically on the earth, you know, we, we understand we carry out some of the physical idiosyncrasies of our parents, perhaps. You know, you have same mannerisms that someone will say is like, oh, man, you look just like your dad. or You look just like your mom. You sound like your mom. You sound like your dad in the way you do this or the way you do that. Uh, we understand that in, the, in that very simple way that we will carry out the deeds of our father, carry out the deeds of our parents, going to look like them as well as sound like them. And that's something of what Jesus is alluding to back in Matthew chapter 12 that we just read, uh, that you know, you're, you're going to, what's in you is what comes out in your words and in your actions. So you're going to carry out the deeds of your father, good or bad. Galatians 5 is, is, a, is a good uh, illustration of that and application of that and argumentation of that as you get into the, the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. You have the deeds of the flesh, though, before you get to the fruits of the Spirit. And so in Galatians chapter 5, Paul is, is teaching and writing about that, about this very fact that you're going to look like your father. Of the devil, it's the deeds of the flesh. We'll read, we'll read some of those a little bit later in our time today. But if you look like your father God, it's the, the fruit of of the Spirit that he's talking about there in Galatians chapter 5. And, and it's interesting that in talking like your father, carrying out the deeds of your father, you, you got this, and, and you know, we talk, we have understanding adoption, and we, we understand some, something of this nature versus nurture thing that we see. We, you see this, you see this in life with uh, children who are adopted. Uh, children who are raised by another family, even if they're not officially adopted. Uh, but, but you see how uh, if, if you know something of the, the natural-born parents, even as they're not raised by them, you can see something of their, of their action, of the children's action, even if they haven't been raised by that parent. But you also then see that the parent who has nurtured them, even though they didn't give birth to them, the parent that nurtures them, the, the child takes on sounding like them even and acting like them because of the nurture of those parents. And that's something of what well, we have to understand that because remember, we've already discussed that by nature, we are all sons and daughters of the devil because of the sin that's been passed on in our DNA. So by nature, we are born of the devil. But by grace, we are adopted by God. And when he adopts us then, he nurtures us and starts to change the way that we talk and starts to change the way that we act. Our deeds are different in the way we talk. And sound is different because of his nurture. Now, 
we understand that every now and then, even though we're nurtured, what's going to happen? That old nature is going to pop up. That old nature comes out. But the more we submit to the nurture, the less that that happens. The more that that is subdued as we are submitted to the nurture of our good father. So that's some generalities. Now, let's get specific. Specifically, as we work through this passage, we're going to see that if God is your father, you will follow the example of godly models. If God is your father, your spiritual father, you're going to follow the example of godly models, physical models on this earth. And that's what we, we learn from this interaction with Jesus and these Pharisees is they're talking about Abraham, Abraham being their father, and, you know, they're descendants of, of Abraham. And Jesus is just like, listen, he, he's not going against Abraham here. He, Jesus says, Abraham, yeah, he's a good example. He's a model that you should follow. But the reality is for you Pharisees that you're not following his model at all. Because if you were true sons of Abraham, sons of God, you would recognize that I am God and you would love me and you wouldn't be seeking to kill me, all these things that we'll, we'll be going through in just a minute. But you'd be following his example. And so that, that's what Jesus is, is saying here. He, he's not saying that it's wrong to count Abraham as, as your father. He's saying what's wrong is that you're not really acting like Abraham is your father. And as he, as he goes through this passage that we're studying, he eventually tells them who their real daddy is, doesn't he? Your daddy is the devil. But for us, most of the people that we're talking to here, and hopefully everyone that we're talking to here, is thinking, all right, I want God to be my father. I want God to be my spiritual father. It is good that we have examples of him to follow, like Abraham, that is laid out here for us. And there are examples in the scriptures. There are examples in your life. There are examples in your church family to follow. And these biblical models, we're talking about fathers here. They, obviously, they can be women and men, fathers and mothers. But you, what we're looking for are biblical models, people who, who model well that God is their spiritual father because they talk like him. They sound like him. They, they, they are like God, and that's who we want to follow. And we want to follow them in every way. And one of the issues that we see here is that Jesus is, is pointing out to the Pharisees that, hey, if you, were, if you were like Abraham, you would treat me the way Abraham treated me. And, and, that, and that could be kind of mind-blowing. Sure, surely it was mind-blowing for these people. Because they, what do you mean? You're standing here in front of us. How did Abraham treat you any kind of way? And Jesus would probably have said, and, and that's what he's trying to get to here. He's like, listen, I've told you that I am. I've told you that before Abraham was, I am. I've told you that I have existed. And you, being students of the Scripture, should understand that I actually had a physical meeting with Abraham. We, you know, we study the scriptures and, and we believe, a lot, of, a lot of theologians believe that when Abraham had these visitors back in Genesis chapter 18, that perhaps Jesus was one of them. That Abraham did have interaction with the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. And when Abraham interacted with the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, he didn't seek to kill him. He didn't seek to destroy him. He didn't seek to uh, reject his word. He received him. He welcomed him. And Jesus is saying, and one of the things that we want to learn then is follow Abraham's example. Follow Abraham's biblical example of receiving Jesus, of welcoming Jesus, of submitting and surrendering to Jesus. And these then are the, the types of examples that, that we want to follow, earthly examples that lead us to receive Jesus. Follow the example of godly models. If God is your father, you will speak truth. You will speak truth. As we were just talking about, kids are going to sound like their parents. If we are sounding like our father God, 
guess what's going to be coming out? Truth. Truth. Because in God, there is nothing but truth. God is truth. And so in in sounding like my father God, I'm going to speak nothing but truth. Now, yes, this entails, obviously, in your day-to-day life, telling truth versus telling lies. Absolutely, that's an application here. We want to be known as as truth tellers. We don't want to be known as, as liars in our everyday life, in our interactions with people. People lie for different reasons. Generally, you know, when people are lying, they're really looking to protect themselves in, in some, some way or another. I know that's why I lie whenever I have lied in my life. It, it's, it's some attempt to protect myself from, from shame or guilt or trouble or whatever it may be, right? But, but that's kind of what drives us to, to tell lies instead of telling the truth. So certainly there, there's that application in our lives, but there's also then the application of, of telling truth and standing for truth in a world that denies truth. And, and, that's, and, and that's, what, that's not just a, a, a late, a, a come lately happening here that the world denies truth. We see that from the beginning. That, that's, that's what Satan did with Adam and Eve in the garden. He starts questioning truth. And so that's always been a thing. Don't fall for any, any idea that, hey, you know, this, this questioning of truth in our society is, is worse than it's ever been. No, it's always been worse. It's just always been worse. That's the way it's always been. That, that's, the, that's the MO of, uh, of Satan, of the enemy from the beginning. And so it's in this that that's, I think, the 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 bigger reality of what we're called to when, when I talk about speaking truth. If, if, if God is my father, then I'm speaking truth. And I'm speaking truth in a world that is challenging that, in a world that doesn't want to hear that truth. And so I have to be resolute in that. We, we, have to, we have to be resolved to speak this truth and stand by truth. Now, the Scripture tells us to and this is something that maybe we get dragged into, and maybe it's the, the nature that we were born into that, that draws us into this from time to time. But sometimes we, it's the way that we speak truth that, that's an issue, right? We, sometimes we can speak truth and we can be angry about it. And that's not helpful. It's not helpful that you're saying the right thing, but if you're saying the right thing in a wrong way, people just aren't going to hear you. They're, they're not going to be as prone to hear what we're saying when we're saying, even though it's the right thing we're saying, but we're saying it in just the wrong way, a way that's not helpful. And so we don't speak truth in anger. We know the scriptures teach us to, to speak truth in love. So we speak it in love. We speak it with mercy and gentleness and compassion. We speak it with boldness and enthusiasm. In a, in a, in a resolu- resoluteness, is that even a word? In a resolute way, we, we speak the truth. But all these things together is how we, we speak it because that's how our Father does it. That's how our Father does it. If you see God as your Father, you will love Jesus. You will love Jesus. That seems Seems simple enough, doesn't it? For for the crowd that we're talking to today, that that seems simple enough. I will love Jesus. But I want you to think about this and and kind of take it to to another level. And I want you to consider, do you love Jesus because of what he can do for you? Or do you just love Jesus? And I I would submit to you that, that that we want to love Jesus. And it's not so much about what he can do for us or what we say he has done for us. We, we, our, our love for Jesus is, is, is needing to go deeper than I love him because I'm saved from hell. Because he's done that for me. Our love for Jesus has to go deeper than, than that. Our love for Jesus has to, it, it includes that, that that's, a, that's a great gift. But our love for Jesus 
also should consider that he's transformed us. He changes us in this nurture versus nature deal. He is the agent of adoption as we are adopted by God the Father. He has changed our paternity, if you will. And so certainly we we love him as a result of all those things. But we also have to love him because he challenges us. We love him because he stretches us. We love him because he calls us. We love him because he doesn't let us stay the way that we were. He doesn't let us stay the way that we are. We love him because he's always at work molding us, shaping us, sanctifying us. We love Jesus because he first loved us. Not just because of what he can or has done for us. If God is your father, you'll carry out his mission. God is your father, you're going to carry out his mission. Now, Jesus, uh, not just in chapter 8, but throughout our study in in the Gospel of John, we've seen Jesus reiterating with these Pharisees and everyone else that he's talking to, reiterating that he's been sent. He's been sent by the Father. He, he's, he has a mission. He's on a mission. We see particularly here in chapter 8 as we're studying that, that his mission is to speak whatever the Father tells him to speak. He, he speaks truth. He speaks whatever it is that the Father tells him to speak. And so that, that's, that's his mission. And that's his mission as he submits himself as the Son to the Father. And so as we might then see him as our brother, rightfully so, as we are adopted, if, if, you, are, if you are indeed a, a child of God, you are adopted sons and daughters, that makes Jesus your brother. It's odd to say that sometimes, right? It's not, it, it, it can be strange to actually say that, and fit, but that's, that's, the, that's the truth. Certainly, he's our, he's our big brother. We don't, you know, I'm not trying to like downplay you know, who he is too much, but, but we follow the example of our brother. And Jesus models for us that he is all about the mission of his father all about the mission of his Father. I only say what the Father tells me to say. I only do what the Father tells me to do. How does he know that? How does he know what the Father is telling him to say? How does he know what the Father is telling him to do? He is in constant communication with the Father. He's plugged in with the Father. Their communication is is not interrupted, man. it's It's a perfect flow back and forth. And so as we apply this in ourselves, in our own lives, as as adopted sons and daughters of the Father, we understand then that we are called to carry out his, he's our Father, we got a mission to carry out. And like Jesus, we should be looking to only say what the Father tells us to say. Only do what the Father tells us to do. Just like that was Jesus' mission, that should be our mission. Just like Jesus understood his mission because of this perfect communication with the Father, this ongoing and constant communication with the Father, seems like we ought to be looking to make that application in our lives. Ongoing, constant communication with the Father through reading his word, through prayer, through interacting with other believers. Maybe because sometimes God speaks to us through other people, other believers. Very frequently he does that. Even non-believers, he'll do that. He'll speak to us through non-believers. You got to be careful. You got to be discerning what you're hearing, making sure it's consistent with the word of God. But that, that's, that, that's how we hear from him. But we carry out the mission. Carry out the mission. Primarily, the mission is going to make disciples. Right? That, that's what, what Jesus left with us in his final words in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. But go make disciples. That's our primary mission that we're called to. 
as we are living this life as sons and daughters of the Father. And then the, the last thing we'll talk about, if, if God is your Father, if, if God is your Father, you will hear the Word of God. You will hear the Word of God. At verse 43, Jesus talking to the Pharisees, says, Why do you not understand what I am saying? It is because you cannot listen to my word. Then down in 47, he says, the one who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason, you do not hear them because you are not of God. And so in this conversation with the Pharisees, we understand that they, not being sons of God, not being children of God, they, they won't listen and they can't hear. They won't listen and they can't hear because it's not possible. It's not possible to hear God if you are not his child. It's almost as if he's speaking another language. And they just can't understand it. But they can't even hear it. They won't hear it. They won't hear it. And, and the weight of, of the Greek words that are used here carries with it, you know, more than hearing. Because, you know, we, we understand that, right? We, we can hear things and not really apply it. We can hear things and, and not really have heard it, not really have applied it, not really have made the mental acquisition of it to say, all right, that, this is what I just heard, and I process it, and that's what this means, okay? That's what's going on when, when he says, you can't listen to me or you can't hear me. He's not saying that they're deaf. He's not saying that they have no way of communicating. They're hearing his words. They're just not receiving it because they can't receive it. They're not believing it because they can't believe it, because God hasn't adopted them. God hasn't adopted them. He, he hasn't made them his, and so they can't hear. They can't receive it. They can't obey it. And that's, that's the weight of, of the word that's meant here when, when, when we're saying then as, as children of God, as sons and daughters of God, we hear the word of God. It means we receive it. We receive it with obedience and not just obedience out of a sense of duty, but obedience out of, out of a sense of exuberance and enthusiasm. I, oh my gosh, my father is my father's speaking to me. Let me hear what he has to say. I, I'm, I'm on the edge of my seat waiting to hear what my father has to say to me today, what he wants me to do today, how he wants me to respond to this situation, to that person. I hear him, and I'm receiving instruction from him. I'm receiving direction from him, and I am excited about it. And I want to receive it. Even if I've been hoping he's going to lead me this way, and now he's leading me this way. I've been hoping he was going to say one thing, but he says something entirely different. But I know it's him who said it. I'm confident it's him who said it. I'm going to receive it with exuberance. I'm going to receive it with obedience I'm going to receive it with confidence. And this, become, this, this confidence comes, this exuberance comes because I hear from the Father. I know his voice. I understand his way, and I'm confident that it's him. I'm confident that it's him that's saying this, and this is the direction I'm going. And so I hear the word of God. Now, talk a few minutes about what it is if the devil is your father. What you going to look like? What you going to sound like? What you going to do if the devil is your father? If the devil is your father, you will seek to destroy Jesus. You will seek to destroy Jesus. As I mentioned from, from near the beginning in Genesis chapter 3, you, we understand that this is, this is what the enemy has been doing. Satan has been seeking to destroy Jesus. Jesus from even before the time that he was physically walking on the face of the earth. From before the time that, that Jesus was, was to be born to the, the Virgin Mary and, and have his 33 years on the earth, the enemy was trying to destroy him. That's why the enemy would, would try to destroy Eve because, hey, if, if this is the the seed that he's going to come through, if I destroy her, then there'll be no Jesus. There'll be no Savior. There'll be no hope for the world. 
Yeah, let me seek to destroy him. Well, let's destroy her. That didn't work. Maybe I can destroy the, the tribe of Judah. If he's going to come out of Judah, let me, destroy, let me destroy Israel. Let me destroy Judah. Let me destroy all of it. And, and, and there will be no hope for the world. Even now, even now, the, the, the devil and his children seek to destroy Jesus. Now, Jesus has come. He's died on the, on the cross. He's ri- risen from the dead. He's accomplished his purpose of, of, of being the atonement for our sins and offering eternal life to those who are called by God. He's accomplished that. But even now, the the, the enemy and his children seek to destroy the influence of Jesus. They seek to destroy the the calling on on people's lives. They seek to destroy God opening the eyes of, 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 of spiritual blind people. They seek to destroy that by seeking to destroy your testimony, your influence with your children, with your coworkers, with your neighbors. Think what it does for your Christian witness, for your Christian testimony. When half the time at work you're talking about being at church, you're talking about this Bible study you're in, and then the other half of the time you're dropping f bombs. Is that a little harsh for the sermon to say an f bomb? It's just as harsh to your testimony and to your witness when you do it at work. Because remember, you talk like your daddy. We talk like our daddy. So who do you sound like? Are you really his? Are you really a child of Father God, or are you just a pawn in the hand of the enemy who's trying to destroy Jesus? Have your eyes open today. Open your eyes to who you really are. Now listen, as we talked about, you know, there's that nature thing, right? And that might rise up from time to time. You know, there's a moment of weakness and, oh man, I, I, whew. but you better go explain to people you know, if it's just it's a one-off thing where you sounded like your father, you sounded like your 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 birth father, the devil, go explain that. Go explain that to the person who who heard you say it. Don't just let it be. Don't let them assume that this is your character. Don't that let them assume that this is who you are. Don't let them assume that this is what Christians do. Don't let them assume that this is what children of God do. Go fix it. Fix it. Acknowledge your sin. Acknowledge that, hey, this is who I was. This is an opportunity. If I'm a child of God, I'm seeing it as an opportunity to draw people to God. But don't let it define you. Don't don't be defined by that nature of your birth father. Because he's seeking to destroy Jesus. He's seeking to destroy you. He's seeking to destroy the church so that he can destroy the influence of Jesus. And I don't want to be a part of that. And I hope you don't want to be a part of that. If the devil is your father, you're going to reject the word of God. You're going to reject the word of God. Back to Genesis 3, that's what, that's what, the, that's what the enemy was doing. Has God really said? That's what the serpent, that's what Satan did, did with, with Eve as Adam's over there watching. Did God really say this? He doesn't really mean that. There's no way. There's no way God will do it. You know, that, that's, that's rejection of the Word of God. That's rejection. Of, now, listen, he, he, he absolutely will take it if you, if you are saying, this is not true. If, if there are people saying, you know, this, this Bible is, is full of lies, it's not true, they, they're, rejecting, they're rejecting his Word, right? They're rejecting his Word in that way, and, and the, the enemy absolutely loves it if, if, you, if you go that far. But the reality is he, 
he's, you know, if you're questioning the word, if you're just ignoring parts of it, yeah, I believe, I believe all of this, but I'm not so sure about this part, so I'm just going to ignore it. You know? Maybe, maybe I'm engaged in this part, so I'm going to ignore it. Say that it's not true. Everything else I'm good with. He'll take that because in that you are rejecting the Word of God. When we lessen the, the impact of, of parts of the Word, we're rejecting the Word of God. When we, when we lessen the truth of the Word, we are rejecting His Word. So it's not just a, a flat-out rejection that we're talking about here that children of the devil do. It, it's, these, it's these little these little changes that we make, these little parts that we choose to ignore, that's part of rejecting the word of God. If the devil is your father, you'll do the deeds of the devil. You'll do the deeds of the devil. That, that's what Jesus is, is saying to them. In verse 41, he says, you are doing the deeds of your father. They said we were not born as a result of sexual immorality. You, you see what's going on there? When Jesus says you're doing the deeds of your father, they, they kind of get where he's going now, that, that, that Jesus is, is, is saying to them, hey, wait a minute, God is not your father. And they, and they shoot back at him with, well, hey, we're not the ones born of sexual immorality. Remember we talked about that last week, I think, where you know, part, of, part of what they're saying is that we know about your birth story. We know that you know, this claim of a virgin birth, but we know that your mama really got with the Roman soldier. And, it's, and, and your your paternity is questionable, right? That's what they're saying here. And, and so, you know, they're trying to, trying to get back at him here. But Jesus holds to this idea that you're doing the deeds of, the, of your father. And then he tells them in verse 44, you are of your father, the devil. And you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. And so he says, that's your father and that's you. And you're going to do the deeds of your father. You're going to act like your dad. You're going to act like your parentage. It's just our nature. Until we are nurtured to something different. But that's what he says. Deeds of your father. I mentioned Galatians 5 earlier, right? We got the deeds of the flesh and the, the fruits of the spirit. Galatians 5, uh, verse 17, we'll start. For the desire of the flesh is against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another, in order to keep you from doing whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are sexual immorality, impurity, indecent behavior, idolatry, witchcraft, hostility, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And they will not inherit the kingdom of God because they are not adopted children of God. They are children of the devil. And so if you act like your daddy, you prove who your daddy is, that's who you inherit from. That's where your inheritance comes from. And so if the devil is your father, you're going to do the deeds of the devil. You're going to seek to steal, kill, and destroy the work and influence, testimony, and witness of Jesus and children of God. That, that's what you will do. Ultimately, you will reject Jesus. You'll reject Jesus. If the devil is your father, you will exchange the truth for lies. You will exchange the truth for lies because that's, that's what he does. There is no truth in him. There is no truth in him, and that is important for us to, to understand. Now, now listen, 
get this, the, the enemy, Satan, man, he will absolutely take, like I said earlier, flat-out rejection of truth, flat-out rejection of the Word of God. He, he absolutely takes that and, and wants people to say, I'm atheist. I, I do not believe that there is a God. I do not believe that Jesus is God. I do not believe that the Bible is anything from God. Yeah, that, that, he, he will absolutely take that, absolutely take it. But I want you to understand that that's not the only exchange, example of exchanging the truth for lies. You know, we believe this to be truth. The lie would be that it's not, okay? But that's not the only example of it. I think more in, of what we see in people's lives when it comes to exchanging the truth for lies and what the enemy does more than anything is he, he twists. Boy, it sure sounds like truth, but there's some twist that he puts on it. There's some, there's some little, little difference that he puts on it. And that little difference makes it a lie. It makes it a lie. It's not truth. But it's a little difference. It's not almost truth. It's not close enough to being truth. It's not, it's not mostly truth. It's a lie. It's a lie. And it, it, he gets us to, to fall into that. Maybe you refer to it as compromise. And, you know, and we often fall in that place of compromising with the truth. We compromise in, in, in different areas of our lives that really make us look like our father who is a liar because we just embrace the lie of compromise with the word of God. We embrace the lie of the little simple twist of the truth. Friends, understand that when we do that and we can do that, y'all. <laughs> Even as we are adopted, our old nature, the nature of our birth father, our birth spiritual father, if you will, the devil, rises up to get us to exchange the truth for lies when we compromise, when we compromise on the truth. In, in so many areas of our lives, we do that. Who we marry, who we date, how we date, sexual immorality, drunkenness. We compromise in, in so many ways. Oh, I'm 21. It's a rite of passage. I'm going to go do what you do when you're 21. And it's just one time. It's good. I'm good. It's true God forgives you. But the lie is that it's okay. Be not drunk with wine. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not okay. It's not true. It, it hurts your father. It's an affront to our relationship with him. That's just one example. You can think of all the examples in your life. I can think of all the examples in my life of how I've compromised, and how I continue to compromise, and how what I'm doing is exchanging the truth for lies, making me look like, in that instance anyway, my birth father, the devil. And so the question for us today is, who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? Who are you looking like in your day-to-day -day life, every day, behind closed doors, at work, at home, at play? Who do you look like? And I realize for most of us here, man, we can, we're examining our lives and, and we can say, at least we can say, man, most of the time, 
a good amount of the time, a vast majority, I'm looking like my Father God. And we praise him for that. We worship him for that. We serve him for that. We, we, we dig into that, man, and, and, and we want to go deeper. We want to go deeper with that and resembling and looking like and sounding like our Father God. But even as we recognize that, we understand that, man, there, there, there's time, and there's too many times that I'm, that I'm comfortable with that I look like my birth daddy. If you're recognizing that today, you're recognizing, man, listen, this is too many times that I look like, that I look like the devil instead of the Father. Then this is a time for repentance and confession. This is a time for prayer. This is a time for commitment. This is a time within your D groups to admit this to each other. This is a time in your Sunday school classes to talk about this. This is a time when you're at home with your family to be talking about this. Man, too many times. I, let, let, and let's help each other. Let's hold each other accountable to that. Maybe, maybe there's someone here, someone watching, and you're recognizing today, oh, my gosh. I'm a child of the devil. I'm a child of the devil. I'm not a child of God at all. I, I've been rejecting Jesus. I've turned from Jesus. God has not been my father at all. I have good news for you. If that's what you're thinking right now, chances are that God is saying, I'm your father. I'm adopting you. I'm ready to adopt you. Come sign the paper. I've opened your eyes of, of spiritual blindness and darkness, and now you see who you have been and who you can be and who I want you to be. Come submit to me adopting you. And so if, if you're recognizing that today, I encourage you to come. Let, let's, let's start having that. Let's have that conversation. I just talked to a man. I had a conversation with a man this week who, 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 who I think summed this up well. He's, he's a guy that, he's in his 50s now. He, he surrendered his life. He became a follower of Jesus when he was 40 years old was his testimony. And you know what he said? He said, I didn't know I wasn't saved until I was saved. I didn't know that I wasn't until I was. And I think that's right. I think that's how it works. And that's what I'm saying to you. If you're sitting here thinking that, oh my gosh, I didn't know the devil was my father, that's what's going on. God is saying to you, I, I want to be your, I'm your father. I'm adopting you. And so if you hear that, receive that and submit to that. Submit to that now. Let's pray. Father, thank you for positioning us, so many of us, so that we can call you Father. God, we're grateful that, it, it's, that you've done that because we, we can't. We can't call you Father unless you open our eyes to the truth that you have adopted us and made us yours. Thank you, God, for the grace and mercy that, that moves on our lives. Your gift to us. Your great gift to your children that you've redeemed, you've, you've, you've bought back with the price of the life of Jesus. Thank you for the atonement. Thank you for the adoption. Thank you for our redemption. Thank you for our justification, our sanctification. Thank you, God, that you've made us yours. Father, I pray that as we live our lives as yours, we live our lives as your adopted sons and daughters, I pray, Father, that we will look and sound more and more like you with each day that we live. I pray, Father, that 
as we look back on it, that today will be the day that we look back on it five years from now and say, you know what? That day, August 21st, 2022, that was the day, the last day that I least looked like God. From that day forward, I've looked more like God. I've looked more like my father than the day before. Every day, more like him than the day before. That was the beginning of something different in my relationship with my Father. God, I'm grateful that you give us today the ability to see that, to see the depth that you want to take us to in relationship with you as our Father. Father, I pray that if there are those hearing this that are understanding today that you are wanting to adopt them, you are adopting them, that they will submit to that today. Surrender, God, to your call on their lives to nurture them out of the nature that they were born into. We're grateful, God, that we can say that, many of us, that you nurture us beyond our nature. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.